theyeshiva.net. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to all of you who are gathered here on this very special evening, virtually, from literally all over the world. Dearest friends, brothers, sisters, ladies and gentlemen, young and old, I send you from, here, from my home here in Muncie, New York, all the love and all the blessings during a very challenging time certainly unprecedented during many of our lifetimes. At this moment, allow me to begin with a prayer, a prayer to our Father in Heaven, to God Almighty, to the Creator and Ruler of the world. Please join with me. Lord on high, we come here before you tonight and we ask you to please bring healing and recovery to all of your children who need it so desperately. Let all of our brothers and sisters the world over struggling from this terrible virus or any other illness be cured and be cured completely. Our Father in Heaven, please bring solace, give strength and empowerment to all those who suffered such terrible, devastating and tragic losses in recent days and weeks with the death of so many loved ones. Dear God, stop this epidemic, help our planet heal from this terrible virus. God, please give strength, resolve, and courage to all of those special heroes and heroines during this crisis who are in the front lines helping humanity. The doctors, nurses, first responders, EMTs, Hatzalah volunteers, all health officials, all scientists, and all researchers desperately trying to find cures for this terrible malady. Give them the courage and the strength they all need to be able to continue to save lives. And give us all the courage and the power that we need during these confusing times to remain strong, to remain empowered, and to remain focused. God, allow us to open our hearts to a new consciousness, a new dawn of love, of oneness, of true healing, and of true redemption. God, have compassion and bring only good and happy news to all of our brothers and sisters in Israel, in America, in the entire world, healing to all those who need it and to all good people in the entire world planet. Help all of us usher in a new era of profound unity, of cosmic oneness, of truth, of authenticity, and allow a new morning of redemption to descend upon our planet. Redeem us of a bitter, dark, and difficult exile very speedily in our days. And let us say, Amen. My dear friends, I'm now going to say a prayer in Hebrew. If you want to join me, I'm opening up to Hillam chapter 19, Psalms. The book of Psalms has always been that biblical book of King David that has sustained us through thick and thin. And I'm going to go to Kapitel Kufiotes, Psalms chapter 119, if you have a Tehillim. Wherever you are, in Hebrew or in English, you can open it up. I'm going to do, it's based on the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. I'm going to do the two letters of Yud and Chaf in Hebrew and have all of you in mind as we pray 
We pray for all those who need healing. We pray for all those who need recovery. And we pray for all of us. And we pray for all the families who have suffered terribly as a result of this virus. Sahi <laughs> Kamo ye may have the homo saitas of root by Mishpot, Koruli Zedim Shikos, Asher Loich, Saira Saho, Kolmitzwe Saha, Muno Shek, Erdofuni Ozreni, Kimat Kiluni, Vorets Vanilas after Vikudaho, Kihaz the Ho Hayeni, Vieshmero Edus Piho. My dearest friends, First and foremost, I want to thank all of you for joining us here virtually from all over the world. I want to thank my dear friends, my dear beloved friends at Chabad.org for doing such a magnificent job and bringing us all together and hosting this lecture on this great evening of 11 Nissan 5780, just a few days before Pesach, April 5th, 2020. And I do want to say that... Chabad.org has Chabad.org slash Corona Passover for all your Passover needs or, all, or anybody's Passover needs. This is a unique Passover coming, quite unprecedented. So Chabad.org slash Corona Passover is an enormous and extraordinary resource to be able to help all of our brothers and sisters the world over celebrate a happy, emancipated, and awesome and healthy, healthy Pesach. You know the old anecdote, it just came to mind this evening about this fellow who had a ticket on the first class of the famous Titanic. And he ordered a drink on the rocks. And the waiter went to get it. As the waiter comes back, it was already after the Titanic tragically hit the iceberg, which happened to be a few days after Pesach, April 1912, literally a few days after Passover. It hit the iceberg. The Titanic was doomed. And this anecdote, both funny and tragic, tells about this fellow who turned to the waiter and he said, I know I ordered ice, but not this. It's always refreshing for people to be able to stay home, to be able to be quarantined a little bit, not to be running all over the place. We all appreciate once in a while those huge snows that keep the kids home and allow us just to breathe. And instead of focusing on making a living, focusing on living itself. We asked for ice, but not this. This court everybody off guard. We are fighting a war against an invisible enemy. The coronavirus size is one approximately 125 nanometers. A virus which we cannot see with our naked eye and yet it has literally transformed every single life on this planet. It has virtually changed every single sector of society, every single industry. There is not an individual who has not been impacted or from one way or another by this invisible virus. Incredible times. People are scared. Some people are hysterical. There's a lot of sadness. There is fear and uncertainty. There is panic by some and there is deep brokenness by others. 
the common denominator is each and every single one of us has been shaken up and shaken up in a very profound way. And it's at such moments where I glean inspiration from one story which I heard from an elderly Jew whom I merited to know, even though he was much older than I am, but when he managed to leave the Soviet Union and come to the States, I knew him in his later years. He was a chassid, a very special Jew, a wise man, and really a servant of God, a, a truly dedicated Jew, a funny man, a humorous fellow, and an interesting character, a very good conversationalist. His name was Reb Mendel Futafas. Reb Mendel Futafas spent 14 years in the gulags. His sin, of course, was preserving Judaism in the Soviet Union and helping Jews get out of the Soviet Union through false passports. He was sent for 14 years into the gulag. As you know, Joseph Stalin has killed millions and millions and many of them in the gulag. After Stalin's death, I believe in 53, Reb Mendel was liberated and in the 60s he made it out and he came to England and then to America. And Reb Mendel used to share stories, experiences of 14 years in Siberia. And he said one night they were sit laying in a barrack and the barrack was filled actually with intellig intelligentsia, people of culture, remember, that anybody who used the brain was a threat to the communist Bolshevik regime. So in the gulag you had thinkers and journalists and essayists and professors and really talented, talented individuals who were sent to the gulag. And he says it was one evening in the barrack, Reb Mendel says, a fellow starts sobbing and he says, you know, I used to have such a glorious life. I was one of the most popular doctors in Moscow. And look at me today. A a person who owns nothing, no money, no career, no honor, no glory. I don't even know if I'm going to survive in this devastating frost of Siberia. Siberia can reach a climate of 70 below zero, plus the hard labor and the starvation and the malnutrition and the way they treated them and the cold and the work and how they slept and the typhus that used to travel, and other viruses and bacteria, most didn't get out. Another fellow in the barrack turns to the doctor and he says, you have what to mourn about? I was a decorated military general in the Tsar's army. I was considered one of the most distinguished generals. What do I have today? Nothing, a prisoner here in Joseph Stalin's gulag. And so it went, the next one who spoke up was an actor, one of the greatest Russian actors who was, of course, imprisoned in Siberia. And then there was a lawyer, and there was a journalist, and an essayist, and a novelist, and a professor, and a writer, and a thinker. And everyone described their former vocations so honorable, affluent, respectable, glorious, now left with nothing. They were crying. They were all crying. One man was not sobbing. And this was this Jew, this Hasidic Jew, Mendel Futafas. And they turned to him, one of them turned to him and said, I know why you're not crying. You must have been a loser before. And you're still a loser. You probably had no real job before. And you still have no real job. You have nothing to cry about. And Reb Mendel looked at them and he said, no, my friends, you're making a mistake. I actually had a very successful business before I was imprisoned. I was quite affluent. I was making quite a lot of money relative to the Soviet Union. And yes, it's very hurtful. It's very upsetting how much I lost. I also have a wife. I'm a married man. I have children. I've been separated from them. So the men look at him and say, so why are you not crying like all of us for the great career that you have lost? And Reb Mendel looked at them and he said, I'll tell you why. Because my primary career, I haven't lost. It has not been taken away from him. 
They looked startled. What are you talking about? What type of business are you running here? Are you running from here in the Gulag? And Reb Mendel said, you see, throughout my life, my main question in life was not what I want to get out of life. It's what life needs to get out of me. I ask not what God and the world can do for me. I asked what I can do for the world at what, what, what I can do for God. My business that I ran was simply the medium through which I was fulfilling my soul's mission in the world. But my primary vocation was to ask myself this question. What is my soul's mission here in the world? How does God want me to serve him? That career, that question, that mission statement has not been obliterated here in the Gulag. It's only the format that changed. In earlier times, I served God through running a very successful business. Today, I still serve God. I serve God as a prisoner in Siberia. In earlier days, my soul's mission expressed itself in one form of living. And today, I still know that my soul has a mission every day and every single moment. It just expresses itself in a different form of living. You see, my friends, the software of my career has changed. But the hard drive, the chip, the quintessence of who I am, what I am about, has not been taken away from me. I was a servant of God then, and I, was a, I am a servant of God now, knowing I still have a mission and I still have a purpose. Wow. When Reb Mendel shared that story, he used to share it with young American kids. Most of us quite spoiled. Most of us did not know of much crisis. Most of us did not th live through personally the pain and the scars of war like some of our parents and some of our grandparents. And we took it as a lesson in life. But today it's more than a lesson. Today for me, this is oxygen. This gives so much perspective and so much guidance. What Reb Mendel was teaching his fellows in Siberia was circumstances never ever define your core. You are never a victim to events that happen around you, even when they are earth-shattering and cataclysmic. Not because you're naive, not because you're detached, and not because you're immune, but because you know that you're here to serve. Your soul is here on a mission. The question is only, what is my mission? And it's obvious that now what God asks of us is a unique calling, a unique vocation. And I would specify at least a few points of answering this question. What is my service today? What is my mission today? Number one, it's quite obvious that divine providence through the coronavirus wants us all at home. Stay home, quarantined at home. Which means that we, I, we, all of us, have a mission at home. We have to do something in our home. What that means, you have to figure out in your life, just like I have to figure out in my life. You know, just in a few nights, we're going to have that extraordinary Jewish ritual called B'dikas Chametz. The Mishnah says in the opening of the Talmudic tractate, P'sachim Oylar Ba Asar. On the eve of the 14th of Nisan, the night before the Seder of Passover, we go around with a candle and we check the chametz in every crevice in our home. And the Mishnah tells us, the rabbis say, a place where you don't bring in chametz, you don't have to check. And the great Hasidic master said, you know what that really means in life? It means I have to check those places where I bring in chametz. Chametz representing toxicity. Chametz representing that which represents an inflated, pompous, hoardy, arrogant ego. I don't bring in chametz to your home. I don't have to check your home. I bring it to my home. I have to check mine. 
So this is a time where each of us goes home physically and conceptually to clean out our own home of chametz. No, not to clean out other people's homes. You clean out the place where you brought in chametz. I have to clean out the place where I brought in chametz. You didn't bring in your chametz to me and I didn't bring it into you. What does that mission mean? It means so many things for so many people. Might it be that it's time to work on your marriage in a very serious way? You're now home with your spouse. It's time to really repair those things that need repair in a respectful way. These are difficult times. People can get on each other's nerves, but in a respectful way to bring up the issues that maybe have not been brought up. If you have a clear path of how to deal with it respectfully, to be able to really tune into your souls and reach a deeper place of oneness, of respect, of love, of camaraderie, and most importantly, of trust. These are special opportunities. Might you need to repair your relationship with your children, individually and collectively? This is a very special moment to spend real quality time with each of your children, talking and listening. Is this perhaps the time when you need to create a greater family, sense of family bonding. Yes, schmoozing together, singing together, choking together, playing together, dancing together. Somebody emailed me that they made a game of music. They went out to their garden in London and somebody with family was playing musical cheers. You remember the game musical cheers? However you can entertain and inspire yourself, but this is that precious, historic opportunity to create solid families because these times of bonding, of closeness, your children will never ever forget. So number one, your home. Turn your homes into mini sanctuaries. The synagogues are closed. Nobody's going to shul on Pesach. Nobody has been going to shul on Shabbos or middle of the week. This is the time that God tells us, I want your home to become, become a mini temple. I want your home to become a spiritual epicenter. I want your home to become a mikdash ma'at, a mini beis mikdash, a mini sanctuary where the divine presence dwells. Let's turn our homes into places of trust, of love, of joy, of camaraderie, of connection, of belonging and that also means not to wet the small stuff and to cut slack for everybody and understand that people are getting on each other's nerves and people are climbing on the walls and siblings do fight with each other and we get into arguments and that is fine perfection is not the name of the game accountability commitment and trust and loyalty is the name of the game but friends there is another very important point and a very important mission today you know, this is a time to go back to the beginning. We all know when the computer freezes and you do control, alter, alternate, delete, alt, delete, and you press restart, refresh. This is a time to go back to the beginning. The slate is clean to ask myself the deepest questions that I simply did not have the time or the mental space to ask myself. I was busy running, I was busy flying, I was busy coming and going, so consumed with life's accessories, deprived of the ability to ask myself questions like, what is life? Who am I? What is the purpose of my life? What is the mission of my life? What is life really all about? What is the distinction between life and the accessories to life? Why am I alive? What is the note that I have to contribute to the divine cosmic symphony? And you know, friends, this is such an opportunity for us individually and collectively because the Jewish people were chosen to be the light unto the nations, to be moral teachers of mankind. As we say in the Aleinu prayer, to heal and repair the world. When have we had a time when we have a captive audience of 7.7 billion people? Nobody's going to the movies. Nobody's going to games. Nobody's going to malls. Nobody's going to clubs. Nobody's going to restaurants. Nobody's going to bars. 
no tourism. So much of leisure is gone. We have a captive audience. People are asking one question. What is life? How do I deal with uncertainty? What does the future hold? What is the meaning of all this? What does God want from us? How did we become so vulnerable when we thought we are so invincible? These are the questions people are asking. They're not asking about impeachment. They're not asking about the next elections. They're not discussing politics and the terrible rifts in politics we have seen. We are experiencing our sheared humanity in the presence of a real war against an invisible enemy. And this is the time when we, individually and collectively, ought to serve as role models to usher in a consciousness, the consciousness that our prophets and our sages have been talking about for thousands of years. We call it the consciousness of redemption, the consciousness of Mashiach, the consciousness of Gula, to usher in a consciousness of love, of expansiveness, of cosmic oneness, understanding that we're not narcissistic, materialistic creatures only. Each of us is an ambassador. Each of us is an ambassador of the divine, an ambassador of love and of light and of healing and of hope. If this cannot bring us individually and collectively to this expansive and expanded state of consciousness, what will? And every one of us is an ambassador. Every one of us has our part to play in changing the landscape of planet Earth. Yes, not everybody is a president and a politician. Not everybody is a great mentor or teacher. Not everybody is a great sage or writer. Not everybody is a millionaire or a billionaire. But everyone was chosen as an ambassador to bring our world closer to a place of redemption, to a place of goodness, to a place of kindness. Which brings me to point three. And here I want to suggest something very practical, literally practical, that you can go away with. I wanted to say you can go home with, but I know, I know you're home. You can go away with. I'm just going to get my drink. I want to suggest something fairly, fairly practical, which I think is applicable to every one of us. Young and old. Women and men of all ages, children and senior citizens. And that is, I want to suggest to you, as a brother to brother, as a brother to sisters, we're all in this together. Take your telephone and each day during the next days and weeks, call during the day at least three people who may be lonely. Of course, you're calling your parents and your siblings and your close close friends and acquaintances and close-knit family. But I'm talking about something else. Can you call the person who lives in the next building? Can you call the person who lives upstairs in the other floor? Can you call an old friend who you haven't spoken to in 10 years? Can you call an old partner you had a dispute with? Can you call an old classmate, a great uncle, a cousin, maybe a third cousin, or even a stranger? Especially those who are home alone without family, People who are not just quarantined in their homes, but they're quarantined alone. Especially the elder and those who need recovery and those who are the most vulnerable to COVID-19. Reach out and when you call them, just say, I wanted to tell you that I'm thinking about you. I wanted to tell you that I'm praying for you. I want to know if you need any help. Can I do anything for you? Do you need food? Is there some way I can help you? Each day I ask you, make three such calls. Not only will you be making the day of those people, you will also be making your own day. You will be transforming your fear into empowerment. From victimhood, you will become a leader. A leader is somebody who asks not what the world can do for them, but what they can do for the world. Paraphrasing John Kennedy or two generations earlier, a few generations earlier, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi Lahavdil, who once told a follower, ask not what you need of God, but ask what God needs of you. The same question Reb Mendel Futafas asked in Siberia. So I turn to you and I say, during that day, at least three, you want to do five, do five, you want to do ten, great. But call three people who would not expect a telephone call from you. Doesn't have to be people from your community, doesn't have to be people who agree with you. 
religious people can call secular people and secular people can call religious people, people from different communities. This is a time when we're all equally vulnerable and therefore we are all equally open to profound camaraderie and love. Let's seize this opportunity because the impact of this when we get over this madness will be extremely, extremely powerful. Now I know friends, there's a lot of panic and there's a lot of fear and for good reason. You know, there was a wise man who once said, every evening he said, I turn my worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. And then there's that famous expression that worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. Somebody once said, worry pulls tomorrow's cloud over today's sunshine. My favorite is this line, worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it gets you nowhere. These are all good lines, but they seem to work at more peaceful and tranquil times. Today, it's not easy. It's not easy. I got a call on Friday from a Hatzola volunteer in Queens in New York. Queens, I think, was hit hardest from all the other neighborhoods in Brooklyn. Brooklyn was hit very hard, unfortunately. But Queens was hit very hard. This is a very good friend of mine. And he wrote, he, he, he WhatsApp me, he says, I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. He's been up days and nights trying to save patient after patient. And he was reaching out for some empowerment and inspiration. He's literally in the front lines of fire. And I phoned him moments before Shabbos as he was getting home to his family. And I said to him, my dearest brother, his name is Svi. I said, my dearest brother, you know, when our troops attacked Normandy, June 1944, the casualties were in the thousands. But every soldier who stepped foot on those shores of Normandy knew this is a time of war. And in a time of war, either you panic and retreat or you find your courage and resolve not because you're not devastated by the casualties, but because you have a mission to complete. At a time of war, there's only two options. Either you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And I said, Svi, we're in a time of war. Yes, there will be a time to cry. Yes, there is a lot of pain. Yes, there is a lot of devastation. What we need more than anything at such a moment in history is leadership, duty, responsibility, love, dedication and caring and resolve. The Holy Master of Simcha Binim of Pshizcha said, you lose your money, you lost nothing. Money comes, money goes. You become sick, you lose your health. It's a struggle because your soul may be healthy, but your body is ill. But he said, when you lose your courage, ooh, you lost everything. War brings out the best in people just as it brings out the worst in people. And this war has brought out the best in so many people. I pay tribute here to all those heroes and heroines in the front lines of fire, trying to save lives through so many different methods. Wow, we love you, we respect you, we admire you, and may God bless your efforts to save lives as you have been doing and you will be doing in the coming days and coming weeks. But now I tell you all of my dear friends, whatever field you're in, this is a time for courage. This is a time for empowerment. This is a time for leadership. Our world needs leadership and the destiny of our nation is to provide wisdom, love, and moral leadership on every level. There are those leaders in the field of medicine, God bless them and may they be extremely successful. But every one of us today must be a leader, an ambassador of clarity, of hope, of wisdom, of courage, of resolve, not because we're not devastated by the pain, not because we don't go to sleep scared, not because we have not lost close friends, relatives, mentors, and teachers. But because in a time of battle, you have to stay focused on your mission. And the mission today is to be leaders, leaders of hope, leaders of spirit, leaders of healing, 
leaders of prayer and people who will help the world usher in a new consciousness of we, not only I, a new consciousness of togetherness, a new consciousness of our spiritual mission. Tonight I receive solace from one special and extraordinary stanza in the Haggadah, in the great Passover text that we're going to read just in a few nights, Wednesday night. Jews the world over, from New Zealand to Alaska, from Hawaii to Brazil, from Kobe, Japan to Moscow, from Jerusalem to New York. Jews will sit and tell the story of the exodus of Egypt 3,332 years ago when we were emancipated from Egyptian bondage. And when we opened the Haggadah, and I know it's going to be a difficult seder for so many, we're used to being with parents and grandparents. We're used to being with uncles and aunts, with an extended family, and some of us are going to have very small seders, and some of us are going to be alone, literally alone. One person doing the seder, it's not easy. And I take solace, and I give you solace, from that opening passage in the Haggadah, one of its opening opening sections, paragraphs. My Sibir, Rebbe Lezer, Rebbe Yeshua, Rebbe Lezer ben Azai, Rebbe Kiva, Rebbe Tarifun, Shoyim Esubim b'Bnei Brak, Voyum Esaprim b'Yitzias Mitzrayim, Kol Oisei Halayla, At Sheigiyu Talmideim, Vomer Lem Rabbi Yiseinu, Igiyaz Man Kriyash Marshal Shachos. It was a story that happened in the second century after the Kamen Era. The great sages, the Talmudic sages, the Tanoim, who lived shortly after the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans in the year 70. Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Joshua, Rabbi Lozab ben Azari, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Tarfin, were in Bnei Brak, in the Jewish, in the city, the famous city of Bnei Brak in the Holy Land. And they were telling the story of redemption from Egypt, Kol Oso Halayla, that entire night. That entire night they told the story until their students came and said, Teachers, dawn has broken. The sun is coming up. It's time to say Shema in the morning. And here I ask you two big questions. Rabbi Akiva was the student. He lived in B'nai Brak. The Talmud says Rabbi Akiva lived in B'nai Brak. His teachers relocated from their homes and they came to do the Seder with their student. Rabbi Eliezer was Rabbi Akiva's teacher and mentor. Rabbi Yeshua was Rabbi Akiva's teacher. The teacher comes to the student for the holidays. The, the, the student comes to the teacher for the holidays. I stand corrected. The teacher doesn't follow the student to the holiday. Rabbi Akiva should have come to Lud, where his teacher Rabbi Eliezer lived. Instead, his mentors came to him in Bnei Brak. How are we supposed to understand that? The question is only dramatized. When we remember that statement in the Talmud, tractate Sukkah 27b, the same Rabbi Eliezer was visited by another student, Rabbi Judah, on the holidays. And he says to him, Rabbi Eliyoy, I'm sorry, Rabbi Eliyoy came to visit Rabbi Eliezer on the holiday in Lud. And his teacher looked at him and he said, you don't believe in celebrating the holiday? I praise those lazy people who don't leave their homes on the holidays because you're supposed to stay home and celebrate with your family. He chastised his student who left his home and came to greet his master and teacher and Rebbe on the holiday. Rabbi Eliezer was upset. He said, that's not the way to celebrate. Stay home. Here... He himself defies his own ruling. He leaves his home on Passover and he goes to another city. He leaves Lut and he goes to Bnei Brak to be with Rabbi Akiva. How are we supposed to understand this? The answer, my dear friends, is by studying that strange phraseology. They told the story of the Exodus throughout that entire night. Hebrew grammar dictated, dictates, it should have said, halayla. They told the story of the Exodus all night. It does not say that it says, Kol oise halayla. It wasn't just all night. They told the story, Kol oise halayla, throughout that very night. That night is when they told the story. What are you talking about? It was a Passover. 
And it was nighttime. Kol halayla, not kol oise halayla. The answer, my dear friends, to these questions, and it's based on a commentary by the famous Oruch HaShulchan, Rabbi Chiel Michal Epstein, the rabbi of Navardik, who wrote a commentary on the Haggadah called Leil Shimurim. Passed away, I think, in around 1908. And he says as follows, he says, these sages were living after the destruction of the Second Temple. Roman oppression has reached horrific levels. The suffering of the Jewish people, the sheer amounts of deaths, was incredibly horrific. The spirit was broken, and these sages could not get themselves to celebrate redemption. They did not see a future. It's not just about them. Isn't that true? In so many cases about different individuals. And that's what he speaks about when he says, they told the story, Kol Oisei Halayla. Not that night, but that very night. That very night. You see, each of us has that one night in life that haunts us, consciously or unconsciously. Do you remember that night when you were given that news that changed your life forever? That night stays with you forever. Do you remember that night when you experienced terrible abuse or another form of trauma? That night stays with you forever. Do you remember that night when something happened that made you lose your innocence forever? That night stays with you forever. Everybody has that kol oisa halayla. That night, that dark experience in your life, maybe as a child, maybe as a teenager, maybe as a young adult, maybe consciously, maybe unconsciously, maybe something from within or someone or something from without, which holds you captive in the shackles of pain, despair, and depression. Some of you I'm speaking to now have been through very difficult experiences in life. What about that night when you experienced loss? When you experienced illness or death? When you experienced another form of profound pain that someone else may not even understand, but for you it represents that night, that night, that conscious or unconscious night which still has me gripped in its terrifying embrace. Do you know, friends, what I'm talking about? That night, they too had a night. And how would they overcome that night? The night when they saw the sun set and it didn't seem like it would rise again. When the brightness of their life was darkened and they all knew they could not do a seder at home. And despite everything, they went to their student, Rabbi Akiva. Why Rabbi Akiva? Because he is the man who the Talmud says at the end of Tractate Makos that these same people and others were walking and they came to the Temple Mount and they saw a fox coming out of the Holy of Holies, which was desolate. And they all wept and Rabbi Akiva laughed. And they asked him, why are you laughing? And he said, why are you crying? And they said, how could we not cry when we see a fox emerging from the holiest place in Judaism? the place of the Holy of Holies where the temple once stood. And Rabbi Akiva said, that is exactly why I'm kvelling. That is exactly what brings me joy. Because in the biblical prophets, we have a prophecy that Zion will be plowed like a field. We also have a prophecy that one day the elderly men and women will come back and fill the streets of Jerusalem with song and dance. As long as the first prophecy was not fulfilled, I did not know if the second one would ever be fulfilled. But now that I see the first prophecy has been fulfilled, Zion has been plowed like a field. A fox can emerge from the Holy of Holies. I know that the second prophecy will be fulfilled. Oh, There will yet come a day when the elders... Elders, the senior citizens, those who are least immune to this terrible coronavirus will dance and celebrate with all of our people in the streets of Jerusalem. And the sages looked at Rabbi Akiva and they said, Akiva nichamtonu, Akiva nichamtonu, Akiva, you have brought us comfort. Akiva, you have brought us comfort. 
When they needed to celebrate Exodus, they knew Rabbi Akiva is the address. They went to Bnei Brak, to the city of Rabbi Akiva, to be in the presence of Rabbi Akiva. They knew that in Rabbi Akiva's embrace, they will still feel the pain. They will still feel the uncertainty. They will still know that these are difficult times. But they will be able to hold on to the courage, to the faith, to the conviction of Rabbi Akiva that we may not understand all of history. But what we do know is that we are ambassadors to bring light into every situation and we never become defined by the darkness. We define it. And this Pesach, we should all go to Rabbi Akiva's Seder. I know you should not physically go to Bnei Brak, as Bnei Brak shouldn't physically leave Bnei Brak. <laughs> Pun intended. But I'm talking about being in Rabbi Akiva's spiritual Seder. In many ways, this year we are like our ancestors who left Egypt. Like our ancestors, we are also walking into unknown territory. We're searching for answers. We're searching for some assured footing. The Jews left Egypt and went in. Lechtech acharai ba midbar be'eretz lo zeruah. The prophet says they went in to a desolate desert with uncertainty. You know, the Brooklyn Bridge, which is not far from where I'm speaking to you now, gets you into Manhattan from Brooklyn. The Golden Gate Bridge gets you into San Francisco. The question is which bridge takes you across when you have to enter into a world of uncertainty? Not Manhattan into Brooklyn or Brooklyn from Manhattan, which can also be a world of uncertainty. Not to San Francisco, which can also be the world of uncertainty, but there's some predictability there. But when you have to enter into a world of uncertainty, which bridge do you take, friends? This is the bridge of Passover. It's called the bridge of faith. We call it a Muna. The Zohar says the matzah that we eat is bread of faith because matzah represents the inspiration and the empowerment of the Jewish people to walk confidently with Moses then and with Moses today into a world of unknown. And it doesn't mean that I understand how it's going to work out. It doesn't mean I understand why it's happening. I certainly don't understand the sheer number of loss and tragedy, but I don't have to understand. I don't have to wrap my brain around divine, infinite mysteries. What I do have to do is hold on strong onto a bridge that has sustained us for thousands of years and has not let us down. It's called the bridge of faith. It was the great 16th century Rabbi Yehuda Leva of Prague. The Maharal of Prague, Rabbi Yehuda Leva, one of the great spiritual sages and leaders of his day, the Rabbi of Prague. Who once said, why is the Seder called Seder? Seder means order. So the literal interpretation is because the Seder follows an order. There's a 15 step program in the Seder. If the Seder can only take as short, right? 15 steps, there is an order through which we progress as we follow through the Seder. But the Maharal asks a very good question. He says, okay, so there's an order. That's why it has the name Seder? Is it defined by order? And he says, because this night confers upon us the most important gift of life. The gift of conviction that there is a Seder in the world. That there is order in the world. Even though life sometimes seems so chaotic and uncertain. Sometimes the world seems like a jungle. Sometimes we wake up and our heart is pounding. What is the website? What are the websites going to tell us today? What is the next WhatsApp going to inform me? And sometimes we're addicted. And every few seconds we have to once again look at our phones to see what is the news. And we live in this world of chaos and disarray. The Maral says that's not how you live. The night of Passover gives you a gift. And it's the gift that there's a Seder. That you're standing on solid ground. That there is divine providence orchestrating every moment of your life. That you are always in the loving embrace of God. 
who runs this entire world. And if he would stop running the world for a single moment, everything would cease to be. Look what one little virus that spilled over from an animal to a human being and this, this human being sneezed. Look what it did to the world. How many things have to go right every day for the world to function normally? Do we think about this? We are always in God's hands. We are his representation in the world. We're his ambassadors in the world. And in that sense, we go into a world of uncertainty. But there's a solid foundation. There's deep resolve. And there's a deep sense of belonging. That's the gift of Passover this year. Perhaps more than any other year before, my dearest friends. And you know, I conclude with an experience I had as a young yeshiva student. I saw it recently made its way around the world, back and forth a couple of times, what they call viral, which was named after a virus, by the way. But there are devastating viruses, and then there are healing viruses. And those are the viral messages that bring hope to people. And I hope and I thank God that this was one of them. And I conclude with this personal story and experience. I was 15 years old. Today, the 11th of Nissan is the birthday of the Lubavitcher Rebbe of righteous memory. And it was February 1988. I was living in Brooklyn, learning in yeshiva. And the Rebbe lost his wife. Rebbe Tzenchaya Mushka passed away. As you know, they never had children. And they used to conduct the Seder themselves. The Rebbe and his wife. There was somebody who attended in the house. My dear friend, Rebbe Shalom Gansberg, who would serve the food and help out in the house. But generally, it was the Rebbe and his wife who conducted the Seder. And then she passed away. And I wonder to myself, with whom would the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, have the Seder? Every Jew in the world, every Jew in the world has somebody to do a Seder with. Everybody. Even the most unaffiliated Jews, even Jews who are not really involved in Jewish life, but for Seder, Passover, they come to a family, they come to a relative. Of course, there's the hundreds of Chabad houses all over the world that host hundreds, maybe thousands of public seders from Kathmandu to Nepal, literally in every community. In 1984, the Rebbe asked the chief rabbis of Israel, Rabbi Shapiro and Rabbi Eliyahu of blessed memory, Zechet Tzadikim Lebracha, Rabbi Mordech Eliyahu, Rabbi Mordech Eliyahu, I remember, 84, he asked them to make sure that in every city there's a public seder for every Jew who doesn't have a place to go there. And I think the Rebbe said he would sponsor it, and he did. Every place in Israel, every yeshuv, every town, every city in Israel, Every Jew has somebody by the Seder. And I remember that year, Passover 1988, there was a young boy, his name was Ari Halberstam. He was later gunned down on the Brooklyn Bridge by a terrorist in 1994. And I, I happened to be standing there, I saw it with my own eyes. He went over to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and he said, my mother asked me to invite you to come to the Seder by us. He lived on 706 Eastern Parkway, which was just a two-minute walk from 770, the Rebbe's shul. So it made sense for the Rebbe to walk over two minutes and be at the Seder of the Halberstams, especially that Ari's father helped in the Rebbe's house. He helped out the Rebbe and his wife years earlier in the previous years. I still remember the Rebbe smiled. He asked him to thank his mother profusely, but he elegantly declined the invitation. Rumor had it then that the Rebbe's long-standing secretary, Rabbi Label Groner, may have a complete and speedy recovery. Also wanted to be at the Seder, but the Rebbe sent him home to his wife and children. And the person who used to prepare the food in the Rebbe's house, Rabbi Shalom Bear, also went home. And the Rebbe did the Seder all by himself. The yeshiva boys, there were a few yeshiva boys who decided to stay there. And they saw after some time the Rebbe came and opened the door himself to greet Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Anavi, and he went back in to finish the Seder himself. And this went on every single year since the Rebbe's wife passed away until the Rebbe himself took ill. The Rebbe conducted the Seder of Pesach all by himself with nobody present. He asked the Manishtana to himself. He asked the four questions to himself. 
the Mishnah says when you have nobody, you ask yourself all of the questions. I was only 15 in 1988, but I felt sad. I felt sad that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a man who inspired more seders in the world than anybody else maybe in history, a man who was responsible for making sure that hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Jews had a place to go at the Seder so they would not be alone and they would not be forgotten. And he himself has nobody to have the Seder with. It was a sad thought. But life goes on, and I really forgot about it, to be honest with you. And life moved on. A few years ago, I was asked to do a workshop for single mothers. I did the workshop. One of the women said, I want to ask a question. And the question she asked was unforgettable. She says, Rabbi Jacobson, I had a very difficult divorce. My ex and I were constantly fighting. I believe he has narcissistic personality disorder, uses the kids as a tool against me, and it's been very difficult. We alternate Jewish holidays with the children. And last Pesach, I was supposed to have the children. I cleaned the house for a month. I bought all the food. I purchased matzah. I purchased wine. I set the table. I cleaned the house from chametz. I got all the chicken and the vegetables and the produce and the meat. The house was spotless. And I was excited. I was working hard, but I was excited that I would have the entire Passover with my four beautiful children. I told my friends and my neighbors and my parents a half an hour before the holidays. A half an hour I was waiting with bated breath to welcome my beautiful children. And my ex-husband phones me and he says, oh, something came up. There's a crisis. I will not be able to bring them for the holiday. She says, Rabbi, why, why? I thought I would faint. I had to grab my, my chest and, and sit down on the couch. I didn't even have the strength to call my parents, to call a friend, to call a relative, to call a sibling or a neighbor and say, I want to do the Seder with you. I couldn't face anybody. I was too crushed. I was too devastated. She said, I didn't have to eat Mara that night. I was the Mara. My life was the Mara. My entire Seder took 25 minutes. It did not feel like Passover. It felt like Tisha B'Av. And I want to ask you a question. Was this called Pesach? Did I celebrate Passover? Did I do the Seder? Was it even worth anything? I mean, there was nothing there. There was no singing. There was no family. There was no community. There was no conversation. There was no argument. How can you have a Seder without Jews arguing? There was nobody saying, okay, enough with the speeches. Let's get to the meal. Let's get to the matzah. Nobody was telling us, telling me how delicious or horrible the matzah is, how bitter the murder is. Nobody was bargaining about finding the afikaiman. It was an orphan Seder. Did it even count? Was it even a Jewish thing? Did it even fulfill the mitzvah? She said, I cried through that Seder. And I just went to bed. And you know, sometimes a thought comes into your mind, unprepared. That's what happened. A moment of inspiration entered from my unconscious into my conscious brain. And I had a flashback. A boy, 15 years old, watching Ari Halberstam, may God avenge his blood, asking the Lubavitcher Rebbe to come and be with his family at the Seder, and the Rebbe is saying no. Going home to my Seder, my parents, my beloved family, and thinking that the Rebbe is alone. And these words literally came to my mouth, and trust me, they were not prepared. They were literally inspired from a place which I do not know the name of that place. And I looked at this woman and I said, you know, all my life, for many years, I was perturbed by this phenomenon of the Lubavitcher Rebbe conducting the Seder alone. It so bothered me. I don't even know why, but I guess I do know why. It just didn't make sense to me. To me, I think I know the answer. As a genuine leader of the Jewish people, the Rebbe needed not only to help his people, but to experience his people. And the Rebbe knew, perhaps, 
that one day there will be Jews who will be forced to conduct a Seder all by themselves, lest they think that their Seder is meaningless and worthless and insignificant and valueless. The Rebbe was setting an example that their Seder is as potent and as powerful and as meaningful as any Seder in the world. Because trust me, I told her, trust me, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's Seder was a Seder. Trust me, he sat himself in the room, but he relived the exodus of Egypt and Jewish history came to life in that room of that one individual. The divine presence dwelled in that one room of that one individual to teach and empower and inspire every Jew who may be forever quarantined at the night of the Seder to know that your Seder is as special, as exalted, as energetic, as powerful, as holy and as divine as any other Seder, which may be filled with the voices of young children singing, asking the Manishtana, chewing on the matzah and bargaining with their parents for the Afikaiman. I told this woman, if the Rebbe's Seder was a Seder, and it was a Seder, trust me, your Seder was just perfect. This Passover, as some of you will be having a Seder alone, I want to ask you to remember this. And I want to ask you to remember the message that this bread of faith gives us and the entire Jewish people as we enter into a world that seems so different than just a few weeks ago. And I say to you, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, and my dear friends, Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazak. Let's stay together, quarantined, quarantined physically, but emotionally filled with love and oneness. Let us usher in a new era with a new expansive consciousness. It's a time for deep introspection. It's a time for deep personal transformation. The world has changed. Do I have the courage to change? Do you have the courage to change? It's a time to heal our marriages, to heal our families, to heal our homes. It's a time to start from the beginning. Most importantly, it's a time for courage. It's a time for leadership. And it's a time for unconditional love and positivity. I call out to you again, my dearest friends. Every day engage in acts of goodness and kindness. Call three people, as I suggested before, three quarantined people, and just reach out. Give them your heart and give them a few minutes. My dearest friends, at this moment, as we say goodbye to each other, I bless you and I pray for all of us and for all of you. May God bring a speedy and complete recovery to all those who need it. May he give strength and chizuk and solace and comfort to all of our dear friends who have lost loved ones during this very, very difficult period where they can't even have visitors during Shiva. May God bring healing to our planet, to our world, to our people. May you all celebrate a beautiful, meaningful, inspiring, and healthy Pesach. Stay home. Follow the guidelines of the health officials because they save lives. Don't, don't do anything that can, God forbid, jeopardize a life, error to the side of caution, and be very, very careful to protect lives at this moment. We each have to do our part because every moment you stay home, you're doing the great mitzvah of helping save innocent lives. Every moment you are quarantined, you're doing a mitzvah. May we experience an era of healing. And may God have compassion on his people and on the world. And liberate us. Bring us out from exile to redemption. From darkness to light. And usher in that great moment. When the whole world will be one. When we will all return to our homeland. Experience the third Bet HaMikdash and the divine presence in the whole world. When all of humanity will be united and the world will be filled with divine awareness as water covers the sea speedily in our days. Amen. Thank you very, very much. My love and my blessings. Gut Yom Tov.
Let's sing a nigan. Hashem, Hashem, Hashem in you, God, I find refuge. I will not be afraid forever. In you, God, I find refuge. I will not be ashamed forever. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.